Okay, we're here for the uh, final debate on 21st century business. Uh, it's going to be followed by uh, Lars, actually uh, trying to sum up some of the main uh, key points from the conference. I would like to welcome, uh, no further introduction, uh, Bill Solani from Whole Foods, Fei Chen, she's the Innovation uh, Platform Director from uh, Grundfos. Uh, as you might see from her name, she's of Chinese origin and probably will bring some global perspective to the discussion. Martin von Heller Grundberg, partner and co-founder of uh, Bender von Heller, uh, the law firm. Uh, Martin is an expert in open source and uh, IT rights. Lars Kolin, until last week, I think, chairman of uh, Grundfos, uh, author, entrepreneur, um, and Anna Scar, uh, co-founder, managing partner of uh, Fusion Navigator. Welcome. Give the panel a hand. So we've been having a lot of discussions during the last uh, couple of two days, and we're not going to wrap them all up in, uh, in this, but one underpinning uh, discussion uh, uh, during the two days, uh, I think, uh, is the interesting notion of uh, not just being a business for profit, but actually trying to create a movement. And uh, these days, movements uh, seem to be something that consultants sell out of a box, it's kind of like everything needs to be a movement. We can do a quick fix and we can make you a movement. It's kind of like the sexy new stuff. So I would like to touch upon um, your views on what it actually takes really to make a movement. We can all do the slogans and the posters and the stuff, but what are the core elements uh, of, of uh, creating a movement? Uh, anyone want to start out? Bill? No, that's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know that I have uh, the answer to what creates a movement. I think you need passion, certainly, right? You need people that care about something uh, so much that they want to change. They want to change the state uh, somehow. Uh, so I think that that's a key component. Uh, I'm skeptical whether you can uh, deliberately create a movement uh, see something like, okay, I'm going to create that movement. I, I believe more, I think, that, that movements arise organically from the ground up, and you don't know you're in a movement until the movement has already begun. Uh, that's, that would be my view. Yeah. Uh, Martin? I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting question, and uh, personally, I've been thinking a lot about it the last couple of months. I, I was very involved in the Stop Acta uh, movement, and uh, I'm currently pretty much uh, focusing on trying to make distortion work because I'm part of that. That's a company, it's a foundation, it's a movement, it's very difficult to see. Uh, I think that what makes a movement, by, if you want to answer, answer that question, you have to realize a movement is something that's moving, it's in flux, uh, and uh, the only thing that you can actually acknowledge is that in order to have a movement, you have to enable some kind of a flow. Uh, and uh, it will probably not be a surprise uh, to hear this from me, but in order to have something flowing, you have to have openness, the frames have to be there. And I think that's one of the conditions that uh, no organizations, regardless of whether it's an organic movement or it's a pretty uh, limited organization like a company, uh, if you're not open, if you're not transparent, things will not flow. Uh, and that's not to say that that's necessarily a good thing, but it's a fact of life. Uh, and uh, what I think, find is pretty tricky and, and, and difficult to think about is that on the one side, it's this openness and this enabling of movements is really beneficial in the sense that that's how we see a lot of interesting things happening. But on the other hand, everyone, everyone here wants to have a closed company that they control. Uh, they they are paying lip service to things have to be open, but all of us wants to be able, I want to have a monopoly and control everything that's around being a lawyer, because that would be very good for me. But, but the fact is that I, in order to survive as a lawyer, I have to be open. And that's the dichotomy or the, the paradox. Any other reflections, yeah. Anna? Well, as I'd being a futurist, um, I think that 
the movement is actually already here. So if the question is not how to make a movement, but how to do this movement from more to better or from away from growth towards something else, I think that we have to listen. I think that we have to move away from using the word do, especially that other people have to do stuff, and moving into being. I think that we are called human beings for a reason, not human doings. And I actually have this little exercise that I would love to do with the folks here, if it's okay. It's, it'll be short. Two minutes? Yep. It might be a disaster, but I hope <laughs> you'll help me out. I, I'm open. <laughs> and the first thing you need to have is a partner. So could you just find somebody, and if you feel like you're a really open person, that just that, okay. so that nobody is <laughs> hanging two and two together. Maybe you spotted somebody that you thought looked really nice. So you guys, you can come here to me, come on. All right. Yeah? So you kind of like scoop in together, you two be over there. And now I just want you to, is anybody, everybody has a partner. Is somebody alone? Raise your hand if anybody is alone. Sophus is alone. <laughs> I'll, I'll do you later, uh, Sophus. Yeah. yeah, okay, that's uh, good. You do wait it. Wait a minute. Great. <laughs> so I just want you for 10 seconds just to look into the other person's eye and not think about anything. Just look into, you know, you're looking into Peter's eyes and I'm yeah, looking sorry, in. Yeah. Just for 10 seconds. And that was Tim. Right. The next thing is, is I want you to take off your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's lucky. Oh, this is really going to be good. <laughs> and I want you to pick up one shoe and swap it with the person sitting next to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I now want you, do you have a shoe? Everybody has a shoe? I now want you to smell the shoe. <laughs> oh, no! no you, shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't I don't do that. Wow. Oh, no. <laughs> you take a big sniff. Yes. Mm. These shoes played basket last night. <laughs> <laughs> and now I want you to... So, hush, hush. Now I want you to look to the other person again. Look into the other person's eyes. <laughs> and then tell this person... Your shoes smell just like mine. <laughs> you have smelly smell shoes. Like so, so yes. Your like shoes smell just like my shoes. Okay, and your shoes smell just oh, no. like mine. <laughs> yes. You can now put the okay. shoe down. And the final thing I want you to do is that I want you to touch the other person. Yes? Okay. I just want you to, yeah, this is really fine. And then I want you to tell this other person that for the rest of this panel debate, I will care about you. Okay. I'll care about you. I'll care about, I'll you. I'll care about you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now for the rest of the panel debate, you need to be in touch with this other person. <laughs> you need, and you can do the foot thing, I'll do you too, as well, yes. Yeah. You can do the little feet thingy if you want to do that, or you can, you know, men really like this one. And if you feel like, you know, you, you start to feel uncomfortable, you know, some people will feel really uncomfortable when people touch them, then you kind of have to push into it, you know, then grab them by the balls or something, you know. <laughs> So that would be to answer your question. No, no, come on. <laughs> I'm a married woman. <laughs> yes, so keep on touching. What if I'm really comfortable? I don't, yes, know, if this, uh, <laughs> I don't know if this actually contributed yeah. to the shoe fetish movement. You but need uh, to keep, keep on touching. It, yeah. it will be, the movement will be uncomfortable. <laughs> yes. This is the right way of doing it. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's why you'll never invite an Escarcha <laughs> panel. Did you lose your thread of thought? <laughs> I don't know if that contributed to the shoe fetish movement, but uh, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> Well, um, I can tell you the reason why is that we are always talking about the other guys. You know, they are and they are, and I think, no, we are. 
we are the problem. We are not stuck in traffic, we are traffic. We did not have the financial crisis being thrust upon us, we created it ourselves. And we need to make a movement towards not being these human doings, trying to fix stuff, but being human beings and realizing that we have everything we need. <laughs> <laughs> last, last pulling is yeah. uh, having everything it needs, I think. <laughs> Welcome to Denmark. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> Bring the whole boots. I'm, I'm going to try not to get this back on track, but... Uh, well. Move okay. with it. Um, so we created a little movement here now. Um, I, I want to skip maybe to uh, question three then. Uh, um, <laughs> apart from us, who are clearly a shoe for this movement now. Um, try to give me one ex example. We've seen a couple of examples celebrating some of the examples here today and yesterday, Whole Foods and the Interface. But what is in your mind some of the uh, inspirational stars of the 21st century combining profits and purpose? Uh, um, who would like to start? Yeah. Last. Yeah. I'd like to give you just... <laughs> Okay, I'll, <laughs> I'd like to give you one example that you guarantee, I guarantee you haven't heard about before. It's a small company in Silkeborg. And that company started as a sort of technically engineering company that would do remote monitoring of water and energy uh, electricity meters. And uh, at some point in time, this technology was actually taken over by the meter manufacturers who actually built in that capability in the meters. So this company uh, could either choose to die or to do something else. What they chose to do was to, to, to transform themselves into a movement for stopping waste of electricity and water. And today, they're actually stopping waste of everything. But this transformation from just metering electricity and water into stopping the waste, changed the business completely. Because now their graphic displays no more showed the consumption, but actually showed the waste, today's waste since midnight, and they calculated it in, in a corner. So today we have wasted energy in this particular building for 335 kroner, or, and water this much. And moreover, they involved the users of the buildings through social media and games into saving more and more and more. And that made that company, which was actually uh, close to being closed, be to become a, a gazelle, high, a, a, a very quickly growing, very profitable company with a mission, making an enormous difference. I think that's a wonderful example of what a movement can be. The what name was of the, the name? company, Keep Focus. Keep Focus. Keep Focus. Anna? Well, I think that uh, the Specialist Foundation, uh, which is a story about a father, his name is Torkel Sonne, and one of his uh, sons were, was at the age of three diagnosed with autism. And the doctors told him that, you know, you have to quit your job or your wife has to quit a job and it will be, you know, such a crappy job to have and uh, just put him in a home. And the father said that, no, this is not going to happen. Then he quit his job and he founded the company Specialist People uh, in order for his son to have a dignified work life when he grew up. And I think that's just, just an, an amazing example of making you know, human beings and making something better come out of a certain group of people who are actually like us. I don't know if you know that we are all autists. You can take an autism test on the internet. One out of, one, one out of 146 people suffer from a severe degree of <laughs> autism. But we all, there would be somebody in the audience here already. His vision is that he wants to create one million jobs worldwide. So people actually come from Africa and from the US in order to find out how can you make a, a work life for people with autism. Uh, and actually there's one here also in the audience from Grundfos uh, that told me that 5% of uh, the people working in Grundfos have kind of like uh, disabilities. So they, they actually see it as a, um, I don't know if they see it as a CSR thing, but they see it as a very normal thing because the founder's father-in-law was the manager of the uh, Fatty Domshim, what do you call that, the mm. poor people's house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So many, many years ago, that was the job that he has. So it's built in, in the foundation of Grundfos. 
So I don't think it's a new thing. I think that people always have had this heart in their businesses. I think that we'll, we've always seen that. That's two interesting Danish examples. Uh, anyone want to contribute with an, uh, a more global perspective? I'll, uh, I'll say Patagonia. Patagonia? Uh, and uh, Patagonia makes outerwear and equipment for enjoying the outdoors. And uh, they, the founder, Yves Chenard, uh, basically started making uh, gear to help him climb mountains. He was a mountain climber. And that's how the company came, came about. And he gradually you know, saw the damage that his equipment was doing on the mountains because he was making pieces of, of metal that you would basically stick in to help him climb and felt like that that was doing damage. So he invented, essentially, a new type of uh, equipment. And then all of their gear, their clothing, all of those types of things, very much in mind of uh, sustainability and closed-loop production. But, and, and so that, that's how the origin of the company, and that's how the company grew. Uh, but they've really maintained their commitment to the outdoors, and uh, they donate 1% of revenue off the top, you know, immediately to charitable foundations, charitable uh, activities, and they've built that into their model so that they know they're going to do that, regardless of profit, so they have to account for that at the, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just find that a very inspiring and interesting model. Definitely. Faith? Yes, um, first I would like comments. I actually would say something about the moment before I say the moment has to be have a high purpose and the people can identify themselves to that. Then and that's the exercise damage everything. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> and we had a very nice discussion at our breakout session about beyond CSR in our group. And what we say discussed is actually now company more and more starts see CSR is not only the report they're going to make. Actually, it's an ecosystem around them. They have to do something different. It's not only their productions. So um, there's one of the guy at the table. He has a very uh, nice uh, example. It's a German company called uh, Bionight, right? Uh, they make the soft drink. And what they do is they, they have this uh, village around them. They take the whole ecosystem very seriously. So they, they use the rainwater and make the drinks, and they plant the forest, so they keep the water flow in the, in the local area. And then they use ingredients, uh, all from the local farmers around, and produce this uh, soft drink. So in, in the way, it's really a positive circle for this whole ecosystem. I think this kind of thinking will really become more and more uh, in the world in the future, in the 21st century. I also heard uh, Coca-Cola start thinking the same way. And uh, recently, I talked with Casper. Uh, they were talking about they have really optimized their production so much. There's not so much things they can do for their own production. So now they have to think in, you know, the ecosystem around the people living there and the way they're using water and they, they treat the waste, water, waste and so on. So this is really very nice. I would say it's a moment for the society across the sectors, across the everything. Anyone going to a Berlin bar would uh, probably be familiar with uh, Bionade, yeah? I have Martin? not tried that yet, so... <laughs> uh, <clears throat> with respect to your, your question, uh, a company has, that combines profit and purpose, I would say that, uh, and that might be a little bit uh, not so high-flying, but, but uh, I would say any company that has ever existed that uh, were made for profit, uh, is uh, the best purpose you could ever achieve, given that uh, you operate under a uh, regulatory framework where you incorporate the social cost into your business model. I don't, I, I, I would, we wouldn't have any, the, on the, any of the clothes or any of the good things we, we cherish on that, unless there are a lot of greedy people out there who actually wanted to make money. And I thank all these persons for that. Uh, the problem is, of course, to make uh, their, uh, the framework for in which they, they operate so they're not uh, sort of making profit on everybody else's expense. But I don't need anybody to have sort of high-flying goals of wanting to save the planet or anything like that, as long as they operate under, under a sustainable regulatory framework. Always here for a little provocation. Martin? Uh, yeah, uh, Lars, you wanted uh, to reply? Yeah, I, I would just add of course, Martin is right, but <laughs> the strategy of making a business in order to make money will work and has worked well over time, but in the future will not work so well. So if you continue doing it this way, I'll continue doing it, I'll do it in a different way, 
and I guarantee you I'll, com I'll wipe you out. Uh, <laughs> because it is a better strategy, I think, to make a difference for customers, etc., and focus really strongly upon that, make a difference for the customers, and if you're really doing it well, you will actually also end up making money, and I don't care whether deep in my heart I started dreaming about the BMW or I started dreaming about making a difference in society. That's not important to me, but actually focusing on making a difference for somebody is really, I think, the best possible strategy. But of course, Lars is right. <laughs> uh, the point is just that uh, you, you're probably right in a, in a, in a, in a world where uh, customers are much more uh, demanding. Uh, they seek much more than just some physical product. Uh, you need to do that in order to make a profit. But, uh, we got, but, but I don't care whether you want to change the world or whether you want to make a profit. It, it's the, the framework within that you're doing it that has to be right. Yeah. We're looking for examples that combines right. We got the traditional business for profit. We got the NGOs trying to save the world. And what we're looking for here is actually the combination of a higher purpose uh, and uh, a, a great also economic uh, bottom line. Okay. But, but, but I would just argue that, that in that situation, you end up with finding as many companies that have actually made a, ne made a, uh, have made a negative impact because their goal become very unclear. I would argue, what about Scientology? They have a very, very clear uh, purpose, and they're not doing it for the money, as this is what they're saying, but, but they can always justify what they're saying because they have a higher goal. Mm. True. Okay, I would like to... Uh, to um... <laughs> I would like, like no, I would like to, uh, we can go into discussions about uh, how, how we like those purposes and, and, and stuff, but I would like to progress the discussion into um, a discussion that also uh, underspun and we maybe didn't make an end to in the educational discussion. Uh, we all celebrate trust as the new thing uh, as opposed to control and regulation. Lars, you're going to talk about that later, I know. Um, but what is going to replace scorecards and control in 21st century businesses. Uh, what is uh, the thing that will make investors or CEOs or chairmen content um, giving up control? Uh, I don't, Martin maybe doesn't want to give up control, but, but some of you others uh, are, are praising uh, trust and, uh, uh, and letting loose. So, so uh, what is the new uh, things taking the place instead of control and uh, scorecards? Good question, yeah? Ah, yeah. wonderful question. <laughs> uh, what's your answer? <laughs> <laughs> I, I really believe the internet actually has changed our world totally. So, um, I mean, people are much more aware of what's going on, and you cannot manage people in the same way as you have been doing before. So I really believe in the future, the really important management uh, um, task is really you can relieve release the energy and the engagement of people. And that's what I'm about. If you really can get people want to work on that with the passion, with the energy, you're, I mean, of course, you need some kind of reporting form. I don't think you can avoid KPI, but I don't think KPI or the, the skull card itself really will be so efficient. It's really you have to release the energy from people. That's what I believe. Bill, reflection from Whole Foods? Well, I think that there's still going to be scorecards, uh, and I think you just maybe are measuring. Lars's example ex was exactly that, right? The, the company started measuring waste, uh, and so it's still a scorecard. It's still a KPI. It's just a different, de different definition of what that is. And so I believe uh, that companies that em embrace a more trusting model of their employees will outperform by traditional measures uh, their competitors. And that will be enough because that will drive the market towards, towards that, if that's truly the better model. Yeah, I think, again, it de depends on are you still looking within the growth paradigm or do you think that something new will happen? Because if you're within the growth paradigm, it's just a matter of giving people more space and time, like the benefit corporations you have in the US, or it would be a matter of measuring people every day uh, which will come with monitorization and it will come with enterprise level apps so yet you have it on your cell phone you can actually see how well do I perform today 
But then again, is that a better way of doing things? Will it move us into a better world? And if we truly want to change to a new paradigm, it will require some sort of intimacy. And my little challenge is actually very much about intimacy, that, that you're actually giving me a lot of energy, Lars. It's really nice. <laughs> but it's also really weird sitting up here holding Lars Kuhlman's hand. <laughs> Imagine how I feel. <laughs> You're all alone. <laughs> and I can see that, you know, that it's, it's funny in the beginning, and then you start breaking up. So even for us who think in what we would say is the better terms, it's still really, really hard for us to trust each other and look into another person's eyes and realize that what quantum physics tells us today is that we are all interconnected. What happens in Africa will have effects on whole food markets and so on. So before we realize that, we're not going to measure the right things and maybe trust would be enough. Maybe it is enough for me to connect with you and be ashamed if I don't do the best I can do because I have looked into your eyes. But until then, I think that we need to look at uh, people and organizations like plants. I don't know, have you ever bought a plant? You know, like a pot with a plant? Do you do that because you want to kill the plant? <laughs> Do you look at the plant and say, come home and die with me? <laughs> we don't, I guess, but still it would happen. But if the plant dies, we know it's because we didn't do our job well enough. And in order for a plant to grow, it actually doesn't take a lot. It has to have water and sunlight and nutrition and a little bit of love and CO2 uh, and some, some earth to, to grow in. But if, if you don't give the plant water, so if water is the delimiting factor, it doesn't matter that you put it into the sun. And I think if we looked to people and organizations like that and said that the purpose of Lars is to be the best Lars that Lars can be, the purpose of Whole Foods is not to grow into the sky, it is to fulfill its potential. I have actually told my youngest son at home because he wasn't doing so well at school, uh, I looked at him and I said, you know, son, it is not so important what happens in school. You know, people can do well and they can do f fine and they can do really bad, but what is important is that you listen to your life's purpose so that you come through school and you feel like you're coming closer to why have you been born. And you know what? You can stay at home living with mom all your life. If <laughs> <laughs> I will talk to dad, but it's really important for me that you fulfill your potential. You are here for a reason. And my son, it was like he had this big crow on his shoulder that just lifted and flew away. And I think if we, you know, if you look to people like that, you know, you have to do your best. You have to be hungry. You have to strive. Like you told that, that, that it's up to your co-workers to actually evaluate, have you done a, a good enough job and have that intimacy to each other. But also to trust that people want to fulfill and they want to grow. And I've been doing this for so many years, and what, every time I meet a new person, they might look like Darth Vader. <laughs> but underneath the helmet is a little Anakin who also just wanted to do a really good job. And like you are sitting here all with your good intentions and your ideas and your own movements, and you just had your new books come out, book come up. And I think we just have to coordinate more than thinking do, 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 do. We just have to be a better person, and we have to... I'm going to water my plant when we can share a shoe, it, yes. we can share a bottle of water. <laughs> yes, sofas. Martin, you wanted to reply? Yeah, I would just add that obviously trust is paramount to success in companies and organizations and societies. It, it goes without saying that it's not just in the future, but also today, those, company, those uh, societies that has a higher level, uh, have a higher level of trust have more efficient, it's more efficient and, and performing better in every sense because it lowers transaction funds and so on. What I think is interesting is uh, that obviously everybody has to realize that uh, if you trust your employees or your employees trust their employers, uh, things will become much more uh, efficient. Uh, you have more growth, you have more profits. Uh, but uh, you don't promote trust in a world where you control. But that doesn't mean that you, don't know, that you don't need a mechanism. Control is replaced by accountability. And the only, reason, the only way that you uh, promote accountability is transparency and openness. And the openness and transparency, the way that uh, not living up to your trust has consequences. Uh, because it is the, whenever I hear this discussion, it seems, it seems to me that they are presupposing that everybody, if they're just trusted, they will never misuse that trust. But that's not how it is. 
Because even though that people want to have, we always say, thinking about a new paradigm shift, but we still have the same DNA, and it's not going to change from one day to the other, and we are self, still self-interested individuals to a large extent. So there will still be a lot of shirking, there will still be a lot of cheating, uh, and uh, if, you, if you don't have accountabil accountability to root that out with consequences to be able to fire people, uh, then you will never create an environment where it will actually make, you will make money by being trustful. Hmm. Okay, Lars? <clears throat> Thank you. When we are to think of and imagine what 21st century leadership is, I would suggest that we looked towards NGOs, voluntary organizations. And this year, in July, as an example, Scouts and Guides in Denmark will build a new city near Holstebro of 40,000 people with every function that a city has. This will be done by about 3,000 volunteers, none of them paid, plus less than a handful of professionals, which means people that get a salary. So you have 3,000 people who work day and night to build a city, and the purpose being to demonstrate that you can create an environment of the 21st century where young people can experience a different lifestyle from what they're used to. And that is such a strong cause that you can motivate all these people to do it. And the interesting point is that there is not one single key performance indicator. I'm sorry. Mm. Not one single. It is all done through passion and collaboration and a shared will to make something great happen. And that is 21st century leadership. And that's what all of us are in business to make happen. I'm going to share an insight with you. Uh, Anna, who is uh, the main organizer of all the practical event here, she's a scout. So. <laughs> okay. Credit uh, that way. Okay, we're going to switch and open up for questions in uh, three minutes, five minutes. Uh, I want to touch upon the last uh, question uh, post here. I invited uh, Josephine Campbell uh, to join uh, this year uh, to do a session uh, called uh, Beyond CSR. Um, that being that really many companies in Denmark, uh, Novo Nordisk, Novo Science, Grund First, a lot of great companies are doing CSR reporting. Um, it's regulatory now in, in many states and also in Denmark to do a CSR report. But it seems that uh, in many cases it's still kind of like a left-hand activity. It's the communication department, the branding department. It's kind of like stakeholder relations, looking good. Uh, what does it take uh, to bring uh, sustainability and recycling and social responsibility into the core? You mentioned some examples, uh, Anna, about uh, specialists. But, but what will it take to make it a, a core priority? Uh, I think more and more businesses experience that this is now core mm -hmm. Uh, of their business models right. due to uh, lack of resources, uh, the prices of, uh, of, uh, of energy and, uh, and raw material mm -hmm. going up. But uh, reflections on that. I was thinking there was a, a bank robber in the US many years ago, and he robbed a lot of banks, and then he got caught, and a journalist asked him, so why do you rob banks? And his answer was, well, because that's where the money is. <laughs> um, and I, I, I just think that, like the movement, the, for me the movement is already here, uh, and I think that CSR is here to stay, but we will come to the same goal with different means. Uh, we have this, uh, we work with trend cards so that people can pick and choose and talk about what they think about the trends, and one of my employees put in a trend card that we didn't believe, uh, which is China saves the world. And he was convinced that China would save the world. I would say, oh, but no, but let's put it in there. And honestly, that card gets picked every time. And it gets picked by Grundfos, and even Finnish engineers pick the card, China will save the world. And the reason why is because they will just come to the same conclusion sooner, so that they can actually sit down and say, okay, if we have this lifestyle like they do in Denmark or in the US, the whole planet will explode. And the good thing about China is that it's not a, it's a good thing, you know, it's not a democracy, so they can say, don't get more than one child, don't buy these things, and then people will actually do it. So at Grundfos, actually, the Chinese people said, that the question is, 
will, will China save the world in time? Uh, I am pretty convinced that in 2020, we'll see McDonald's make healthy, sustainable food. I'm, I'm really convinced that they will, because why shouldn't they? They don't have an, an interest in killing their target audience. Uh, I know from, uh, from, from first-hand experience that they are actually sitting talking about how they can get their core clients to eat less McDonald's food, even at McDonald's. So, so do you know what I mean? That they will come to the same conclusions with different means in the old paradigm. And then we are sitting there, we were, we were thinking, oh, do you remember when McDonald's was this awful junk food yeah. in the old days? Yeah. Now they're this really with heart and the nice employees and they read the book and all this stuff. <laughs> and, and China, you know, when we get stuff made in China, it's sustainable. And do you remember when made in China was this crappy, yucky stuff? Oh, that was in the old days. Mm. So in, in Denmark, we really want to get their hearts first. It's very important for us that we have this debate and we're really philosophical. Um, and I think that's fine. I think it's good. I think that uh, Churchill said that uh, the empires of the future are the empires of the mind. So maybe if we have a really good mindset, sharing, caring, it's loving. An, <laughs> it's an interesting perspective. <laughs> but, and we're coming like back to China in many senses. Uh, we have to do some uh, serious reverse engineering in many fields now, uh, the other way around. They used to do that. But... Uh, but um, they also have another uh, model, right? There's still a, uh, a dictatorship to some sense. Uh, um, uh, and they are able to do the changes in, in China, actually, a radical change from the political level. Uh, Mao Tse-Sung said, uh, you, you have to destroy to rebuild. And, and, and um, it seems that Western governments and Western uh, companies don't have the same uh, kind of like brute force to really take the radical step into the future. Like McDonald's, I hope you're really right. In, in, in Denmark, we have Novo Nordisk, uh, Novo Nordisk uh, mm. also at, at, uh, at party time say, well, we are put in the world to eradicate diabetes. That's a, that's a really bold statement. And, and I think uh, some of the employees came to Lars Reven after saying that and said, well, if we destroy our own business model, what we will do? And he said to them, if we'll crack this challenge, I'm sure there'll be a lot of companies willing to hire us. Beautiful. I went home and thought, that's beautiful. But when you look at their research and development expenses, they're still not spending more than 0.1, 0 0.0 mm. uh, percent in actually preventing people from being fat. So it's a nice speak, and I really hope you're right. But, uh, but getting it into the core, I think Interface uh, showed an example of an uh, oil and glue company, the world's largest producer of, uh, of, uh, of carpet tiles, making a change in 1994, actually radically embracing uh, recycling. So, so what is it, uh, Lars? Is it, uh, is it old men uh, getting old, uh, caring for their legacy, making a change? Or what actually drives change? I, I want questions from, uh, from uh, the change, Rebelling Change Workshop, and we're going to get to that in a minute. I hope to hear from you, Ask, or some of your participants. But reflection first here, and we are open for questions. Well, if we are talking about paradigmatic shift, uh, Papa and Kuhn, who wrote about paradigms, said that old men have to die before new thoughts can come in, which doesn't mean you have to go out and kill people. <laughs> but it means that things take time, you know, that you also have to be patient. And talking from experience, and now I'm just reflecting upon my own experience, is that what I can see that the people who are in high places in society today, what they have in common is that they can cope with humongous amounts of bullshit. They can endure boredom and lack of visions that would kill a whale. <laughs> so they can sit, do you know what I mean, last You sit <laughs> with these people where you have unending bullshit PowerPoint <laughs> presentations and consultants speak and yada, 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 Absolutely. doing crappy products without ever having the reflection, why are we doing this? You know, my, old, my, my husband works for AP Moller Mursk and sometimes he comes home complaining about his work life and then I look at him and I say, honey, do you think that your problems has something to do with that your job is to extract the final drop of really yucky oil out of the womb of Mother Nature? <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, I have to go for a run. <laughs> you know, the mammals, the middle-aged men in, in Lycra who are bicycling away from their own body, telling them they're doing crabby, yucky stuff. 
Uh, okay. so, so you have, you know, you just have these people who they are, they, they can't reflect, they can't ask the question why, and he's not a bad person. It's just never been a part of his job to do so. <laughs> and I see a new kind of generation and a new company is coming in and they are asking why all the time. You know, why, 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 why? Why are we doing this? And I think success in the new paradigm is still coping. It is still coping, but now with complexity and looking at the world and embracing it and not looking as, as a problem, but looking at China and saying, wow, it's a whole continent coming out of, of Purdom. Amazing. Looking at people's thinking, Wow, it's a hundred thousand years since you crawled down from the tree and now you're sitting here massaging your feet. That's fantastic. You know, I think we've come so far in a hundred thousand years, maybe we should be a little bit patient about that, uh, that we can actually crack the code. Okay, we're going to open up for questions from the audience. Who wants to start? Stefan? Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Stefan uh, Miller. Um, it all sounds very nice that the paradigm will shift and we're already here, we're a mu movement, we just have to connect and then problem solve. I'm a bit skeptical when looking on what other governments and countries are doing, especially when you look at, um, look at the social capital, I mean the capital funds, the VCs around the world, you see Acumen Fund, you see Root Capital, you see uh, even foundations like the Clinton Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, focusing on these issues from a finance uh, return of investment point of view, when you look, about, look to Denmark and focus on, so how is Denmark, both in educational-wise and on the capital size, focusing on scaling up some of the great examples you just gave, like the specialist and the specialist people, they actually came from one social, and they got investments from one social capital fund, the first one in Denmark, called the Social Capital Fund, uh, and they only have 25 million crowns. That's nothing compared to the social capital funds in UK, for example, or in the States and so on. So I think that's two things I want you guys to talk about, and that is how do our education right now help uh, us as hopeful, aspiring social entrepreneurs to build those sustainable businesses? And the second thing is how do we get the capital, the funding, as Tim has worked with, how do we get that in a much larger scale to Denmark? Because the ideas are there, the spirits are there, but we need to scale up our, our ideas. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Education? Um, I, no, I, I would like comment because you're talking about China. I think keep quiet. But now <laughs> I have to comment, Chan. Um, I think we in Denmark, we kind of um, very comfortably believe that we are really in front in the CSR and environmental area. We have to have a sense of urgency. China is coming. And they're coming very fast. Because the government actually, in the five years planning, they have decided they're going to do something for the environmental and for the sustainability. In China, when they say that, they do it. And they do it, they do it in five years. I mean, we are talking, it's very, very nice. We have very nice uh, democratic society. Sometimes we are very slow because we have all have agreed, I mean, before we even move one inch. But they are really moving in a very fast speed. And that's we have to be really very careful about that. And, and taking the wind power as example, taking the solar sails, and China is catching up. And the biggest the solar sail producer now is in China. Mm. I mean, for five years ago, there's not a possible scenario for us to imagine. So don't just sit in here and talk. We have to do something. <laughs> and they're talking about social uh, uh, capitals. And I like the, the idea Bill was talking about this um, whole food uh, market. We don't even need to put a lot of money in. If everyone just put $100 in, and with, uh, with the people we have, we can really get some social capitals. So we can do something different now with the in internet, with the connections we have. That's what I want to say. Thanks. More questions? Yeah. yeah. The last? Yeah, his, his I'd question. like to answer. Can I answer that question? Yeah. Uh, or come up with a suggestion. <laughs> I, I think that um, there was an American president once who said that there will always be people who have an interest in telling us that life is so complicated that we can't live it by ourselves. And I think that is what happens today, that we're always told that there's so much complexity and this and rules and regulations and blah, 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 blah. So we go on mental retirement. We're thinking, oh my God, I need somebody to come and do stuff before I can. I think we have an unprecedented opportunity right now to take responsibility and get the power. If we do that, then in 10 years' time, 
we will see that we didn't need the organizations. Like we heard yesterday, we need banking, but we don't need banks. We need journalists, but we don't need media houses. We need education and teachers, but we do not need schools. You need access to money, but you don't need a venture capitalist fund to come and get you that. And what we see is, again, I think that we, are, we, we need to be, to be a little bit patient. We need to think like Jedis, that you might be up against the evil empire and, and the Death Star <laughs> and Darth Vader. And if you're sitting in the evil empire, being a little stormtrooper in the canteen, coming up with a fantastic idea, and say, hey, go and pitch that to Darth. <laughs> <laughs> That's really hard, but if we think like Jedis, like do the right thing, the force will be with you. I'm absolutely certain that you will find it, but maybe you'll find it in some different way, and maybe you didn't get as much as, as you were here for, but whoever do that. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is that a winner is just a loser who did not give up. So if you have good energy with you, if, if, you, like, if you love what you are doing, uh, be it being in the capitalist way of doing things or being in a more whole food way of doing things. I think in the end you will succeed and if you want to do it, you'll find the way of doing it. I'll lend you some money if you want to. Who wants to lend him some money? 50 coins? Yeah, we have two, three? We, yeah, we, we need, no, yeah. we need to close now, sorry. <laughs> I want to I thank you all for, uh, for uh, listening to this panel. I want to thank the panel.